I am now pleased to introduce our first speaker, Charles Lee. Charles is the Senior Policy Advisor for Environmental Justice at the EPA, where he leads the development and implementation of the EPA's agency-wide environmental justice strategic plans. He is also widely recognized as a true pioneer in the area of environmental justice. We are so grateful he is with us today to share his work and insights. Charles? Thank you, Kate, uh, and good, good um, morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is a real pleasure to be here. Um, I want to thank Kate and Josh Hamburg and the National Institute for Healthcare Management for inviting me to this webinar and to uh, really express my appreciation for their focusing on this important issue. Um, Uh, my, my presentation is going to cover uh, the following topics, uh, background on environmental justice and disproportionate impacts, um, the area of, of environmental justice and air pollution, um, particularly um, the lived experience of communities, uh, which is really important for understanding environmental justice and the empirical evidence, uh, structural racism and EJ and then strategies and methods to advance um, community air protection. Uh, talking about the historical roots of environmental justice, the uh, four um, pictures or four items I have on this slide uh, kind of speak to some of the um, seminal events starting in 1982 uh, in Warren County, North Carolina, where some 500 people were arrested protesting uh, the siting of a PCB landfill. The, in 1987, um, uh, the first national study on the demographics related to the location of hazardous waste sites was issued by the United Church of Christ Commission for Racial Justice. I wrote this report to put the issue of environmental hazards in um, people of color and poor communities and indigenous communities on the map. Um, and, and at that point, environmental justice was unheard of and I actually did not even have a name. In 1991, uh, the People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit coalesced a national grassroots environmental justice movement and codified the 17 principles of environmental justice. And in 1994, uh, President William Clinton signed the Executive Order on Environmental Justice 12898. Um, and called on federal agencies to identify and address as appropriate the disproportionately high and adverse environmental and human health effects of their programs on minority populations and low-income populations. Um, in the main, EJ is about the lived experience, as I said, of environmentally and economically distressed communities, and Kirschmoke, um, who is the former dean of, the, of the, the Howard University Law School, once said that EJ is the convergence of the two great social movements of the latter half of the 20th century, civil rights and environmentalism, and called environmental justice the civil rights issue of the 21st century, an idea that is really uh, coming to pass in a big way. So what is environmental justice? It's defined as the fair treatment a meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income in the development, implementation, and enforcement of laws and regulations and policies that affect um, the environment of public health. And at the bottom of this slide, you will see uh, some elements of what is a taxonomy of environmental justice. So moving to the idea of uh, the science behind uh, disproportionate environmental health impacts. Uh, this slide shows um, the drivers uh, from um, the built environment, the natural environment, and the social environments. And in this case, um, a great example to illustrate this is air impacts. Um, of course, uh, everyone knows now uh, that the uh, uh, idea or uh, the um, recent crisis, um, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, dra dramatically illustrates this relationship. Um, uh, recent reports uh, point out the grim reality of disproportionate mortality from COVID-19 in Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities, um, and they have been shown uh, to have uh, links to both uh, air pollution as well as the social determinants of health. Um, 
What is really important to gather from this slide is the fact that this relationship is not just speculative. It's, it's, there's evidence behind it. Uh, one uh, prime example of that is the recent study by the Harvard School of Public Health that found that when PM 2.5 exposure goes up, uh, the number of COVID-19 deaths also goes up. So in the 30 years since toxic waste and the toxic waste and rape report, thousands of peer-reviewed journal articles have produced empirical evidence about the, dis the, ev about the existence of disproportionate impacts. And these range from um, uh, studies that look at the characteristics identified here uh, from exposure and proximity to pollution sources, the cumulative impacts, and these take place in all kinds of uh, environmental media uh, that are listed above. And it is important to point out um, that these also relate to the occupational environment. So talking about the idea of disproportionate impact, um, this um, graphic is important to me uh, because, um, you know, we're talking about um, uh, the uh, uh, spatial distribution and environmental uh, burdens and benefits. And typically, people of color, low-income, and indigenous communities face multiple environmental hazards and their lack of environmental amenities like fresh food or green space or, and other things. Uh, the slide um, kind of traces uh, how our understanding of um, disproportionate impacts have evolved over the past uh, two decades from anecdotal descriptions of the things that, you know, some examples of which are shown on this slide, um, uh, to um, a process or processes which can combine, which can uh, combine both pollution burden and population characteristics that lead to greater vulnerability. As a result, we can talk about uh, disproportionate impacts now in a rigorous way. Um, and essentially, um, I would define disproportionate impacts as a consistent pattern of greater uh, pollution burden and population vulnerability affecting the same populations, uh, same communities. It's primarily those with people of color, low income, and indigenous um, populations. So two of the um, uh, tools that um, brought this uh, uh, brought about this understanding are, are EJ mapping tools that look cumulatively at pollution burden and population vulnerability, such as California, Cal EPA's, California EPA's um, Cal Enviro screen tool and US EPA's uh, EJ screen tool. And this slide uh, shows you the um, uh, uh, Cal Enviro screen, which does provide cumulative scores uh, for every um, uh, census tract in the state of California using the formula that is on this slide. And then the next slide shows the, um, uh, the environmental and demographic factors used uh, for indicators in EJ screen. The key thing I want to um, um, share with you or have you take away from this is uh, the fact that EJ screen is totally interactive, uh, accessible to everyone uh, in every part of the country, and therefore is a really useful tool or has proven to be a really useful tool. And we urge you to um, really uh, go and uh, take advantage of that. So moving over to the, um, to the um, area of air pollution impacts and uh, environmental justice or disproportionate air pollution impacts, it would start with the lived experience of communities. Um, you know, in the South Bronx, uh, I remember uh, back in the 1990s, uh, this was a huge issue that the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council, which is a, a formal advisory council on uh, EJ to US EPA, uh, uh, focused a lot and wrote a report on uh, waste transfer stations in the South Bronx. Um, and uh, today, uh, it still remains to be an important issue, um, uh, even though progress has been made. Uh, second uh, example I have here uh, is Norco, Louisiana, uh, particularly the community of Diamond, uh, which is uh, one of the many communities in the Louisiana Chem Chemical Corridor that were post-1976 
slavery share, sharecropper communities at the edge of plantations now converted to petrochemical plants. Um, this one, um, which is next to the Norco facility, um, organized to relocate itself under the leadership of a Ms. Marjorie Richard, and her efforts were recognized uh, with the Goldman Environmental Prize Award. And um, the story is a, uh, the community story is the subject of a book by Steve Lerner, which has a uh, foreword by uh, Professor Robert Bullard, a preeminent EJ scholar. And the last picture, um, uh, which I think has, uh, speaks to us today because of all the uh, uh, wildfires now taking place in California, uh, is a stark reminder of, uh, about um, how um, certain groups are being overlooked. And this is a picture of farm workers uh, having to continue to work during the wildfires in Cal California. Uh, it is not only a stark reminder of disproportionate impacts that are overlooked, but a sign of the future cha of future challenges related to climate change. On the, um, in terms of historical evidence around uh, disproportionate air, uh, air pollution impacts, I want to uh, take you back in 1992. Um, uh, this actually was uh, in um, an EPA journal. Uh, entitled, uh, this is the EPA journal that focused on issues of uh, uh, disproportionate environmental impacts and uh, at that time's environmental equity. Um, and um, it's entitled, Environmental Protection Has It Been Fair? And uh, this um, brings um, uh, data from uh, the Argonne National Laboratories, which um, uh, talk about uh, disproportionate uh, impacts. Um, I think the uh, thing I want to leave you, the key information I want to leave you there is um, the, um, in the graph, the percentage of the population near, uh, living in areas of non, uh, one or more non-attainment um, is the following, 50%, 57% for whites as opposed to 65% for African Americans and 80% uh, for Hispanics. Our current uh, studies on disproportionate environmental impacts are um, uh, uh, exemplified by these two recent examples, uh, one by Michelle Bell and uh, Kaitu Ibichu from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, and by uh, Christopher Tesson and others at the University of Washington. Um, the uh, Yale study shows unequal, dis uh, the unequal exposure on the basis of race to the airborne particulate matter components of PM2.5, or PM2.5, um, and um, all which are arrayed on this um, on this slide. And the University of Washington study takes a, a really interesting slant. It focuses on the differential between the exposure burden borne by communities of color versus the benefits in terms of cons consumption of those goods and services. Um, uh, and associate that with exposure burden. Um, this is, a, of course, a very intricate analysis as shown by this graphic, but it boils down to the finding that whites experience a pollution advantage of 17% less pollution exposure for goods and services uh, associated with their consumption, while Blacks and Hispanics experience a 56% and 60% ex ex excess exposure. So at EPA, um, there has been lots of work um, uh, done around the EJ and air uh, pollution arena. Uh, one example I want to point out uh, is the um, uh, is the figure on the left. Uh, the EJ's uh, strategic plan measure on the percentage of low income pop of the low income population in the United States living in counties meeting the annual and 24 hour PM 2.5 national um, uh, ambient air quality standards for the years 2006 to 2016. Uh, and this was reported in the uh, EPA's FY 2017 EJ progress report. This is noteworthy for a lot of reasons, but it's uh, especially for the fact that uh, it is an example of how EPA um, has been uh, trying to um, start to look at environmental justice in terms of environmental outcomes. And of course, we all know, and the challenge of our work 
um, is to make differences in the conditions uh, in communities. And uh, as hard as this may be, uh, and as difficult as many of you note, um, it is to document these things, um, you know, is a real credit to EPA that, um, you know, they decided that this was something that was important to do. The other study um, it then, uh, which came out in 2018, uh, is the study by the Office of Research and Development uh, that um, show how disparities from PM from stationary sources are, in fact, still increasing. Um, and, um, you know, there's a lot of um, things that go into all this, but one of the uh, things I want to point out is uh, as progress is being made, um, you know, the, uh, the areas that are left, um, you know, in non-attainment are going to be harder and harder to deal with. And then the, in, in that context, issues with disparities are, are going to become greater and attention towards eliminating those disparities uh, is going to be uh, really important. I want to move over now to um, another uh, study, which I think uh, is one of the most important ones in the in the uh, in uh, the EJ area, and this is by um, uh, Professor Rachel Morello Frost and Bill Jesdale at the University of California at Berkeley, and it looks at uh, measures of how um, segregated the relationship between uh, racial segregation and estimated um, cancer risks. Uh, associated with ambient air toxics. And what they found was a correlation between um, a level of uh, racial segregation and estimated cancer risk. And um, as, you go, as you can see, the higher the uh, level of racial segregation, um, the, um, the higher estimated lifetime cancer risk. Um, this is not only true for, um, uh, for individual uh, groups, but also for these uh, municipalities as a whole. Um, uh, and so um, this is a good way to transition to my next slide, which um, really focuses on um, uh, issues of uh, 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 structural racism and environmental justice. And these are, um, this is a, um, um, a map, these are maps that were created by um, a thing called the uh, Mapping Inequality Project, which was a project of the University of Richmond and um, Virginia Tech. Um, what it did was to produce a resource um, of um, having the 100 uh, redlining maps from the 1930s for 108 cities. And redlining, as you know, is the intentional policy of racial steering for where people of color can live um, uh, and um, sy systematic dis disinvestment. Uh, this is overlaid against um, Cal EPA's uh, Cal Enviro screen results for the city of California. Uh, Oakland, California. And as you can see, there is a correlation between these past policy choices and current environmental conditions. There are a lot of things to take away from this, and this is, uh, can be a subject of a full um, uh, webinar in of itself. Uh, but one of them um, is that um, uh, what um, uh, the uh, uh, Mapping Inequality Project did was to create an information source that's going to generate uh, many studies, one of which was published uh, in February this year, uh, and that was on the correlation between these redlining maps and the current location of urban heat islands, uh, something which um, Jeremy Hoffman, one of the uh, uh, co-panelists here today, will be discussing. So this next slide is one that I just want to leave to you and, uh, you know, for you to think about because, um, you know, the conversation that we believe needs to go to, you know, other examples of public policies and uh, government programs, um, you know, that, um, you know, have um, these uh, processes of structural racism affecting them. And, you know, these could be in the areas of, um, you know, particip uh, par uh, participation in decision making, um, in uh, disparities in resource investments or in equities in the development and implementation of regulations. Um, this is something I just want to leave because, um, you know, I think I would like um, to take uh, the last slide and then, you know, transfer that to something like this in which you yourself can start to think about what this means for you in terms of your own experience and in terms of your own work. Um, my, I'm going to conclude with talking about the emerging strategies and methods or approaches for um, addressing 
um, uh, community uh, 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 air protection. Um, and, you know, one of the most important developments is the, um, uh, and, and I want to put that in context, I think that one of the most important uh, developments in um, the history of environmental justice is the fact that the practice of EJ has matured to a point where there are now um, approaches that can be taught, learned, and replicated. And a great example uh, of a great place to identify some of those is the uh, California's Air uh, Community Air Protection Program under the ages of um, uh, what is also known as Assembly Bill uh, uh, 617. Uh, it uh, developed um, a framework uh, to focus on community action, and many of these elements uh, are, of which are identified here. Um, there's a, uh, and in addition to that, 13 communities were identified for pilot activities, uh, which involved the uh, local communities, affected communities, the uh, regional air quality management districts, um, and, um, and what they did uh, was to, um, you know, start to map out community-driven strategies for addressing uh, air pollution impacts. Um, one example of that uh, is um, the, what in West Oakland, um, uh, and uh, recently they produced a, a, a plan called Only Our Air, which is the West Oakland Community Action Plan. Uh, the, um, uh, it has over 90 strategies involved, some of which are uh, kind of the key ones are uh, here uh, in terms of moving uh, polluting businesses and activities uh, from, from away from residents, uh, moving towards a, a zero emission port, uh, funding clean trucks, cleaning up industry, reducing car trips and road dust, and stopping backyard burning. Um, this is all available um, to you in this report, uh, only our air on the uh, Bay Area uh, Air Quality Management District uh, website. I do want to point out that uh, an important uh, person in this is a community activist, um, a longtime community activist named Miss Margaret Gordon, um, who not only um, was a co-founder of the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project, but um, uh, has become an icon uh, in this area. And uh, one of the things that um, she uh, had the honor of being is the uh, appointed a commissioner of the Open Port uh, Authority. So, um, uh, so I think that um, you know, in uh, when we start to look back, we're going to find three uh, important paradigm shifts, uh, and uh, uh, the experience in California is a great place uh, to uh, begin to kind of mine these uh, for lessons. The first is uh, moving from um, uh, large geographic scales to neighborhood scales, uh, where a lot of these air pollution hotspots are in disproportionate impact of communities are located. Uh, and so it um, creates the ability or opens up the ability to focus our science tools, particularly those related to community monitoring, uh, strategies to address local land use, uh, regulatory tools, and other, other approaches um, that were identified in the last slide. Second, um, you know, this involves a conscious attempt to involve the community in the process in terms of joint planning and decision making and other governance process in which the community has a meaningful seat at the table. And thirdly, um, I think um, the kind of things presented in this presentation um, uh, means that there needs to be greater attention on the legacy of structural racism and institutionalized actions and institutionalized actions uh, which address racial equity and justice. Um, the current national conversation on structural racism provides a good opportunity to collectively tackle this issue. Um, the West Oakland Community Action Plan has set ambitious goals as shown here uh, for the elimination of air quality disparities and a, and a good place to gain lessons, um, as I said, about replicable approaches, which everyone in the nation can um, benefit from. So in conclusion, uh, there are four things. I think that um, environmental justice um, is proving to be a very powerful lens by which to understand current issues, um, one of which is, of course, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. 
Um, secondly, not only um, does, um, is, does ample evidence regarding disproportionate uh, impacts of air pollution exist, but it is actually growing. Um, thirdly, uh, disproportionate, um, air, disproportionate air pollution impacts are demonstrably linked to structural racism. And lastly, uh, there are uh, replicable strategies and methods to advance community air protection that are emerging, um, then that is really good news. So I want to close there um, and, um, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present to you.